What a week! If you had told us a week ago that Starship's wet dress rehearsal for Flight 4 was not going to be the biggest news of the week, I don't think we would have believed you. And yet, here we are, coming into the final week of May, and we have road closures for flight, marine safety notices, airspace closures, and we have a launch date. On top of that, SpaceX dropped a huge update detailing exactly what happened on Flight 3 and what Flight 4 is going to be all about. Of course, there's always a lot of interesting Starship-related things going on around and even outside of Starbase, so we'll be covering all of that as well. Howdy, Tank Watchers. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Brilliant. Let's start off at SpaceX's McGregor, Texas engine testing facility, where an interesting event happened this week. I know, I know this is Starbase update and not McGregor update, but I think you'll all agree that this is kind of Starship related. What you're seeing is a Raptor engine test on the tripod stand that probably didn't go exactly as expected. You can see how the engine first is taken out in a primary explosion, and then a secondary explosion takes out more of the GSE. It looks quite violent, even compared to previous RUDs on the tripod stand. If you didn't already know, McGregor, Texas is where SpaceX tests every single one of their engines. Falcon 9 boosters and second stages also pass through here for testing as well. The tripod stand has been used as a vertical Raptor engine test stand for a few years now, and we see SpaceX testing with it like once or twice a day. Of course, we don't know the parameters from the test or what SpaceX was trying to test. SpaceX is known to not only perform safe verification tests at McGregor, but also tests that intentionally push the envelope of Raptor. So in the absence of further details from SpaceX themselves, it's kind of hard to put in context exactly what we're seeing here. However, given the size of the explosion, even if they were testing this engine to destruction, I doubt they wanted things to get quite that spicy. Thankfully, the two tanks that are up on top of the tripod stand appear to only be used for nitrogen, at least as far as we can see from the frequent flyover photos provided by our contributor, Gary Blair. What's up, Gary? The methane and oxygen tanks appear to be on the ground far away from the actual explosion itself, so that's good. And it's important to note here that engine test stands are built to do exactly that test engines, not fly them. If you're going to have any kind of explosion or other issue on your engines, the best possible place for that to happen is on the ground in a test stand, not while you're flying. We don't know exactly how long it's going to take the tripod stand to come back to active duty, but you can keep track of it yourself using our 24-7 live stream, McGregor Live. Previous, though less energetic, RUDs have seen the stand come back online after two to four days, so either way, it won't be too long. All right, with that out of the way, let's head here to Starbase, where SpaceX has been super busy moving tower sections from the port of Brownsville to their Sanchez lot. Sections one, two, three, six, seven, eight, and nine are now all at the Sanchez site, while sections four and five remain at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility in Florida. And you can keep up to date on what's going on with them on our quasi-monthly KSC flyover videos. It's unclear why SpaceX hasn't moved these two sections to Starbase yet, but as of our last KSC flyover, we can see that teams are still actively working on them. So maybe they just want to wrap up all that work before transporting them. So at least for now, it looks like we're done with tower rolls in Boca Chica, at least until those last two sections are finished and barged over from Florida. Along with those two tower sections at Roberts Road, SpaceX also still has a set of chopsticks, a chopsticks carriage, and a ship quick disconnect arm. It is presumed that these are going to be for the next pad at Starbase, as there's no other pads that currently require these pieces, at least when it comes to the chopstick parts. However, 39A is still lacking a ship quick disconnect as well, so at some point they'll either have to install the one they have on the tower or build another one. You may remember from our previous updates that SpaceX is hard at work tearing out the suborbital pad to make room for Starbase's second orbital pad. You know, the one where all those tower sections are going to go. In the span of just two weeks, SpaceX has completely torn out the entire suborbital tank farm. This is just the first step before teams go in and level the entire area and prepare it for the construction of the second orbital tower and tank farm, or whatever else SpaceX is going to build here. Who knows, maybe another parking lot. 
Before we move on to the production site, let's take a moment to hear from this video's sponsor, Brilliant. Do you ever feel like your brain could use a workout? Do you want to learn STEM topics interactively and at your own pace? Then Brilliant.org is the tool for you. With Brilliant, you get fun and interactive lessons in all kinds of topics that help you achieve your goals and learn more effectively than just watching or reading something online. Whatever subject you want to drill down into, Brilliant has a course for you. I just did their logic course as a fun way to give my brain a snack and unwind without just endlessly doom scrolling, and it was a treat. Even for topics that seem daunting, as math does for me, learning a little bit every day can add up over time and help you expand your knowledge base and comfort with all manner of concepts. Help out your brain and our channel by trying out everything Brilliant has to offer for free for an entire 30 days by going to brilliant.org slash NASA spaceflight or clicking the link in the description. The first 200 people to sign up will also get 20% off an annual premium membership. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. All right, now let's head over to the production site where SpaceX has been moving hardware around for upcoming vehicles. This week, we saw a new Booster Common Dome section being rolled out of the Star Factory and staged next to Mega Bay 1. Barring any potential test tanks, this should be for the next booster in line, which would be Booster 15. We can never be sure of these numbers until we actually see a label, and who knows, SpaceX may just randomly skip numbers as they've done in the past. With the impending jump to Starship version 2, it remains to be seen how the naming and version skipping for all the different boosters and ships will play out in the end. This new common dome section sports the same new liquid oxygen valve that we've seen on previous boosters like Booster 13 and even Ship 30. Along with that, it turns out the cowbell vents are not going away as we had thought. They're just being changed, as you can see here. This could be part of the changes to the attitude control system that SpaceX has hinted about in their most recent info dump, which we'll talk about in just a bit. Currently, Booster 15 has no ship assigned to it, as all Block 1 or Version 1 of Starship are already assigned to a booster or won't end up flying. But there are signs that there could be more ships coming soon. Remember in previous Starbase updates when we talked about the welding test article that was used to verify the welding robot in Mega Bay 2? That's right, this week it was moved out of Mega Bay 2, signaling that that structure might now be ready to support the construction of the first version 2 Starship. So now all we have to do is hopefully wait just a little bit, and we'll soon start to see SpaceX stacking the first version 2 Starship in Mega Bay 2. It'll be really interesting to see exactly how fast they can do that, especially compared to how they stacked the current and soon to be outdated version of Starship. All right, while we're at the production site, let's do a quick check-in on everyone's favorite parking garage. As you can see, in the last week, there's been a lot more progress on the structure, and the two halves of the building have been joined on one side. Also at the production site, of course, we have to talk about the Star Factory, which continued to get outfitted this week, both inside and outside. Here you can see a new work stand that will be moved inside of the factory soon. All right, now let's head to Massey's and check in with a good friend of our producer, Kevin, Ship 26. Ship 26 has been living at the Massey Outpost for the last two or three weeks, hanging out on the new Ship Static Fire Stand. We had all been kind of wondering what was going on with this little flapless fella, as we hadn't seen any testing done on it, but that changed a few days ago. Just this past Friday, Ship 26 appeared to undergo some sort of cryogenic test while on the new Static Fire Stand. We sadly don't know any more than that, as we no longer have the usual signs that we were able to use when the ships were being tested on the suborbital pad. For now, all we can do is keep watching and see what happens. Maybe we'll be able to learn some of these patterns so that we can anticipate future testing, just like in the old days of tank watching. All right, now let's move on to the big news of the week. Work continues on the orbital launch mount. No, I kid, I kid. We have official word from SpaceX about exactly what happened on Starship Flight 3, and more importantly, we now know what to expect on Starship Flight 4. In this latest update, SpaceX confirms what we saw, which was a successful ascent for both Booster 10 and Ship 28. This is the first time that this has been done successfully, and as we know, the problems for both vehicles began while they were on their way back. SpaceX also confirmed that six Raptor engines shut down during Booster 10's boost back burn. That's a lot of Raptors, to say the least. The culprit was something that was already a problem on Flight 2, filter blockage. Again, some of the filters that prevent debris from entering the Raptor engines were blocked, which then caused a loss of pressure and ultimately shut down of the Raptors. 
SpaceX unfortunately did not explain what exactly was blocking the filters or why this is a recurring problem, but hopefully they can sort out a long-term solution for it going forward. Okay, so that's what happened during the boost back burn, but Booster 10's flight didn't end there, and the problems only got worse during the landing burn. Because of those early engine shutdowns during the boost back burn, the onboard computers decided to deselect those six engines and not use them for the landing burn, so the booster would only have the use of seven of the originally planned 13 engines. However, at engine ignition, only two started, and of course, this meant the booster could not slow down fast enough. SpaceX says it lost communication with the booster at an altitude of 462 meters, so either the booster ripped itself apart at that height, or that's the last blip of data they got before impact with the water. An important thing that was confirmed, though, was that indeed the flight termination system was not triggered. In terms of potential fixes for this problem, SpaceX says, quote, super heavy boosters for flight four and beyond will get additional hardware inside oxygen tanks to further improve propellant filtration capabilities. And utilizing data gathered from Super Heavy's first ever landing burn attempt, additional hardware and software changes are being implemented to increase the startup reliability of the Raptor engines in landing conditions." End quote. So that's Booster 10. What happened with Ship 28? Well, as you probably saw during the launch, Ship 28 got onto its planned trajectory and headed towards the Indian Ocean. However, not long after engine shutdown, it was pretty clear that the ship had lost attitude control and you're never gonna believe what caused this. That's right, a clog, again. This time the clogging was on the attitude control valves, basically the tank's vents that control the roll of the vehicle. If they get clogged, then of course, no gas can come out of them and they stop working. It's because of this lack of attitude control that Ship 28 did not enter the atmosphere in the correct orientation and with the control that SpaceX had anticipated, hence why it was lost during entry. As SpaceX said, quote, the lack of attitude control resulted in an off nominal entry, with the ship seeing much larger than anticipated heating on both protected and unprotected areas. The flight test's conclusion came when telemetry was lost at approximately 65 kilometers in altitude, roughly 49 minutes into the mission. SpaceX also pointed out how important it was for them to see the views of reentry in HD from all of the onboard cameras, thanks to the use of Starlink. This allowed them to gather crucial information about Starship's re-entry for the next flight. Getting to see and analyze this will help them make the re-entry on future ships more reliable. In order to solve the attitude control issues, SpaceX has introduced additional roll control thrusters, which we already have seen installed right above the methane tank on the ship. This would make it a more redundant system because if one set of thrusters fails, there's another set that can do the same work. Shortly after this update on Flight 3 from SpaceX, they also announced a target date for Starship Flight 4. In fact, this all happened while a good chunk of our team was in Leicester in the UK for an NSF meetup that happened this last week. We have breaking news. Just share with the class. We, we have, hang on. We have breaking news. SpaceX has just posted an update on on Starship, yeah, it's about flight three, so everyone pull up. Oh. oh! Of course, all of this didn't just happen out of the blue. Early in the week, SpaceX had completed the Flight 4 wet dress rehearsal with Booster 11 and Ship 29. This test was supposed to go through all of the steps in the countdown, going all the way to T minus 10 seconds. But whether or not they took the test up until that point is up for debate. We saw the propellant load finish, but we never saw, for example, the detonation suppression system come online when it should have. It also appeared that the liquid oxygen tank on the booster hadn't been loaded completely, which already happened on the last flight, but this time the level of liquid oxygen seemed even lower. It's unclear what issues, if any, SpaceX ran into during this test, but either way, afterward, Ship 29 was de-stacked from Booster 11. One way or another, this was expected, as more work needs to be done on Ship 29's thermal protection system tiles. And of course, its flight termination system needs to have its explosive charges installed before flight. A new set of road closures that have been posted for next week indicate that perhaps SpaceX will be conducting another wet dress rehearsal. Or maybe they'll do something completely different, but either way, we'll keep our eye on it. With Ship 29 de-stacked, it originally seemed like SpaceX was going to roll the ship back to the production site for that final work on its thermal protection system, but that ended up not happening. However, it seems they decided on keeping it at the launch site and finishing the remaining work there. Teams have spent a ton of time and energy to get Ship 29's heat shield in as perfect of a condition as possible so it has the best possible chance 
to get through re-entry. This decision to keep it at the launch site may very well be because of the need to repeat the wet dress rehearsal. The closures I was just mentioning go from May 28th to May 30th, from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central. So now, with the two vehicles of the full stack for Flight 4 almost ready for flight, you can see why SpaceX was able to put out a no earlier than date for Flight 4. We also now have marine notices and airspace closures for both launch and re-entry. It appeared that originally the launch was being targeted for June 1st instead of the 5th because of road closures for launch that had appeared from June 1st to 3rd. But hey, maybe a few more days getting everything right doesn't hurt, especially if that means a more successful flight as a result. The notices and hazard zones that have already gone out indicate that Flight 4 is going to be just like previous flights, and that means it's going to occur sometime after 7 a.m. Central. Indeed, SpaceX's launch date update was accompanied by a confirmation via their website that they're targeting a window opening at 7 a.m. Central. This webpage is the usual that SpaceX operates for every launch, be it your ordinary Starlink, some mysterious government mission, or the fourth launch of the world's most powerful rocket. These mission pages always include an introductory text explaining the mission and then a timeline of events prior and after the flight. For Flight 4, SpaceX is going back to the basics. No fancy propellant transfer demo, no in-space Raptor relight, no payload bay door test. Just go up, be in space, get through re-entry, and get back for a landing. For this, the trajectory will be pretty much the same as the last flight, and the ship will be aiming for the Indian Ocean. Again, the main objective for Flight 4 will essentially be trying to get through entry and landing of both stages, demonstrating that Starship can be fully reusable. Demonstrating this would be a game changer and probably a lot more important than deploying dummy Starlinks or having to demonstrate things that are maybe not as important for the current version of Starship. There are, however, some other changes that we can extract from this update post. One of the most significant changes is the ejection of the hot staging ring. After the boost back burn, probably during the flip for re-entry, SpaceX will dispose of the hot staging ring. This is to save some weight during these early test flights to give the booster a better chance of making that virtual catch. Another change is that the ship's flight will not end after re-entry, and if, and that's a big if, the ship gets through re-entry, it will then go on to perform a flip and burn to attempt a landing. The countdown also saw some changes as SpaceX is going to attempt to fuel the stack four minutes faster than previously. This is of course due to the significant tank farm changes that will allow for faster fueling of both vehicles. So there you have it. That was an absolutely massive update from SpaceX. It's always nice to get info directly from the horse's mouth. So now we know that SpaceX is targeting no earlier than June 5th for Starship's fourth flight. And it seems like all the pieces from the marine hazard notices to the road closures to everything else are lining up in support of that. What do you think? Will the FAA grant the launch license modification in time? You know what to do. Let us know in the comments. All right, that's it for this week. Thank you for watching. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Remember, use code NSF to get 20% off your annual premium membership. All right, we'll see you next week. And don't forget, be excellent to each other.